You want to start off there in uh, verse 18? It says there, But if you be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now, a few years ago, I was at a Bible study, and somebody tried to use this verse to tell me that if you're led of the Spirit, which he said everybody that was saved was, then you're not under the law. So then if you didn't have any other rules in the New Testament, it was just, you know, uh, love everybody, and then everything else went. So, um, verse 18 says, but if you be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. And verse 14, a few verses before that, says, for all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So they use those two verses together to say, as long as you love your neighbor, there's no, there's no thou shalt nots. There's no, no, no thou shalts. You just as long as you love everybody, you're good to go. And of course, we know the Bible is a, has a lot more uh, rules and things that we should do. That more than that. Um, in fact, if you look at the verse right after verse 18, it says, "Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these." And then it gives us a whole long list of different things, like adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Idolatry, witchcraft, and it just keeps going on and on. So it's saying, those are the works of the flesh. And verse 18 says, but if you be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. So now, now what is, if we're led of the Spirit, that's our new man. Our new man doesn't sin, okay? So our new man is not under the law. But if we live in the flesh, we're not led of the Spirit. And, and I mean, these people, of course, they don't get that. They weren't even using the right Bible. I don't even know what why I was having a Bible study with them, because they weren't studying the Bible. Um, it's, just, it's just funny how they like to brush all these rules that God gave us to do, and brush, brush them under the carpet and say, as long as you love your neighbor, you're good to go. So if you would, turn to Galatians uh, 3, it's just a couple chapters back, and go to verse 10. Galatians 3, 10. So, what does it mean that we're not under the law? Okay, because obviously it said that in Galatians 5. It says, um, if you're led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. Well, that is true, but what does that mean? So, in Galatians 3, in verse 10 there, it says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all the things which are written in the book of the law to do them. So, right there is the curse of the law. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. And we'll pay attention to verse 13 here. Sir. It says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. That the blessing of Abraham may come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Okay, so... Jesus Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. So we're no, no longer under uh, the law as far as if we don't do everything that is contained in the law, we're not going to be cursed, okay? We're not going to have to go to hell for one thing. Okay, that didn't mean the people in the Old Testament went to hell they didn't follow all, all, all the, the law because it says no flesh will be justified by the works of the law. Nobody could keep the whole law. But what it means is even, even those people back then that were under the law, they still had grace through faith, but the law was a schoolmaster to, to, to show us the things to come, and it was also, um, it was to teach them how to live, and, and to, to teach them how to obey God. But uh, let's uh, go back here, this drop down to verse 24. So yeah, it was saying here, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we may be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Okay, so the law foreshadowed uh, the coming of Christ. It, it also foreshadowed other things that are coming in future prophecy. Um, I mean, the burnt offerings, they were a picture of the slain... Uh, body of Jesus, the burnt offering, you know, that's a picture of Jesus going to hell, and, and there's just on and on, there's things in the law that, are, that were done for a certain reason that that we could see what was coming in the future if, if people were paying attention and, and 
listening to the word of God. Um, okay, so if these things were just a shadow of things to come, now that Jesus died and he rose again, now we're just good to go. We don't have any more laws or no more sins that we can commit. And no, that's not true. Because in Romans 6, verse 14, it says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Okay, so we're not under the law. Verse 15, What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. So we see, we can still sin. There's still such a thing as sin, even though we're not under the law. So that doesn't mean all those rules in the Old Testament are just out the window just because... Jesus died and, and that we're not under the law. That's, that's not the case. In fact, when Jesus came, he made some laws even more clear, okay? When, in, uh, in Matthew 5, for instance, when he, and this is uh, very uh, clear here, it says, think not, in verse 17, Matthew 5, 17, think not that I'm come to destroy the law. Okay, so Jesus didn't come to destroy the law. Or the prophets, I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Okay, so he's saying, till everything is fulfilled, there's not one little part, like a jot or a tittle, like I think those are like a small Hebrew letter or an accent or something. It's very just the smallest part of the law was not going to change. Or was not going to pass, sorry. It was, wasn't going to be passed till all was fulfilled. Verse 19. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and teach, shall teach men so he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But so whosoever shall do and teach him, the same shall be great in the kingdom of heaven. So anybody that teaches that they don't have to do these commandments, if they're saved, they're still going to heaven, but they're going to be called least. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be called least in the kingdom of heaven. I want God, God to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. I don't want him to... I mean, don't get me wrong. To be called least is still at least you're not in the other place, right? You're not in hell. You're, you're, you'd rather be the doorkeeper in heaven than, you know, to be the, the best position in hell if they even give such a thing there. Obviously, there's different parts of hell, but that's a different sermon. Okay, skipping to verse 27, Matthew 5, it says... Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. Okay, this is an example of how Jesus explains the law further. Verse 28, But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. So Jesus didn't just do away with the law. In fact, he made it stronger. He, 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 he made it even more clear, all right? He says, even if you just look on a woman to lust after her, you've already committed adultery. Okay, the Old Testament says, thou shalt not commit adultery. Here he's explaining it even more, even if you look at a woman to lust after her, you've already committed adultery with her in your heart. So Jesus didn't do away with the law. So as a saved person, I'm glad I'm going to heaven, okay? But I don't want to go teach people, as long as you, you love everybody, you're good to go, you're going to heaven, or as long as the Spirit hasn't talked to you and placed it on your heart. The thing is, in the beginning, this your, your conscience will tell you, don't do that. Or, but the thing is, if you never read the Bible, how are you going to know it's sin? Okay? Or, but the thing is, if, if you get reminders in your mind and your heart, you just ignore those, eventually they're going to go away. Okay? They're not going to be as strong. And so, if they say this false doctrine, well, as long as the Spirit hasn't spoken to you about it, it's not sin to you. That's just a wicked false doctrine. Um, let's turn to Hebrews 9. Hebrews chapter 9. So, I mean, we, we know that Jesus didn't do away with the law, but does that mean we're, we're doing animal sacrifices and all that? No. We don't even keep the feasts anymore. So there are some things that have changed in the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 9. Okay. So, but how do we know which things are, are done away in Christ? Okay. Um, and which things we still have to keep. Because, I mean, if God, we want God to bless us, we don't want Him to curse us, we don't want Him to chastise us, we got to figure out, okay, which rules do we still have to abide by, and which ones are fulfilled, okay? And, and the thing is, if God wants us to keep those rules, He's going to He's going to list in here, He's going to find out, give us a way to find out which ones we have to still keep. 
So how do we know? Well, some theologians will say if it's not repeated in the New Testament, then you don't then you don't have to keep it, okay? And, and that's just it's just weird because what about witchcraft? You find anywhere in the New Testament that witchcraft it says you're not supposed to do witchcraft anymore? Does that mean we're just okay to do witchcraft? No, it doesn't. That's just a, a, a weird explanation by a theologian, okay? And, and, and some of them will say. Uh, well, we're just we're just going back to uh, before before Moses. Okay, we're going back to the time before that, and that's how we know. Okay, we just we just rewind the clock. Well, that doesn't make sense because back then they could marry their sister. Okay, <laughs> we can't marry our sister, and we'd want to anyway. Like, amen. So it, it that doesn't make sense either. You can't just go back to like Noah's time and say, okay, that that's that's when, uh, how far we have to go back. But the thing is, how do we know um, which ones are good to keep? So Hebrews 9 verse 1 says, Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. Okay, so notice the word ordinance. Ordinances. Okay, we're going to deal with that a little bit later here. But notice also the first covenant. So the first covenant is the, the, the covenant he made with the children of Israel. Now we are under the new covenant that was brought in by Jesus. Drop down to verse 9. Verse 9 says, Which was a figure for the time and presence in which, we, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the con conscience. Okay, so which was a figure? So like I was saying, it's a picture of things to come. Verse 10, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances. So there's the word ordinances again. Imposed on them until the time of reformation. Okay, and what is the time of reformation? It's when Jesus Christ came and made a new co covenant, okay? He reformed it. He, we had the old covenant. He, he changed it into the new covenant. At the time of Reformation. So the old covenant stood in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances. So it, but it says imposed until the time of Reformation. So those things that are listed there are things that we don't have to do anymore. Okay? So it's not just whatever before Moses came, and it's not just whatever he repeated the things that we got to keep. No, if he didn't specifically, if he did not say we don't have to do them anymore, we still have to do them. But this covers a big territory though, meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances. So what are ordinances? Um, if you would go to Numbers 15, I'll, I'll read for you um, the first mention of the word ordinance in Exodus 12, 14. So you're going to Numbers 15. So in Exodus 12, 14, it says, And this day shall be unto you for more, a memorial, and you shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Okay? So the first mention we have of the word ordinance is about a feast. Okay? And I'll just quickly read for you the next few verses explaining which feast it was. Seven days shall you eat unleavened bread, and the first day you shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day... That soul shall be cut off from Israel. And in the first day there shall be an holy convocation, and in the seventh day there shall be an holy convocation to you. No manner of work shall be done in them, save that which every man must eat, that only may be done of you. And you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for in this self same day have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall ye observe this day in your generations generations by an ordinance forever. So it, that is one of the ordinances, okay, these feasts. This was the the Passover and the and the day of unleavened bread, or the seven days of unleavened bread. Okay, so we don't have to keep those feasts anymore. We don't have to you know, slay the lamb and put the blood on, on, on the doorpost and the, and the lentil. We don't have to do that anymore. Um, we don't have to, you know, make sure we have bread and put a yeast. And we also don't have to keep that day and do no more work on them, right? Because when the day when Jesus got crucified, the, the first day was Passover, and then the next day was the first day of unleavened bread. And then because of the year that it happened, which is this is a different sermon, but the next day was a Sabbath. So the three days that Jesus 
was in, in the tomb, nobody had to work. Okay, so, but this is an ordinance and we don't have to keep it anymore. So, feast, number one, feast. You don't have to keep feast anymore. Number two, um, you're there in Numbers 15. Let's look at uh, verse one. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When ye be come into the land of your habitations, which I give unto you, and will make an offering by fire unto the Lord, a burnt offering or a sacrifice in performing a vow, or in a free will offering or in your solemn feast to make a sweet savor unto the Lord of the herd or of the flock, then shall he that offereth this offering unto the Lord bring a meat offering of a tenth deal of flour mingled with the fourth part of a tin of oil. So he gets pretty specific about what they're supposed to do. And the first thing, uh, just a small rabbit trail here, uh, the definition of meat. We see here, meat is not like we would think of steak or hamburger or something like that. He's talking about flour, a tenth deal of flour. So meat in the Bible meant food. It didn't mean flesh. Like the Bible would say flesh. We we'll call what we call meat nowadays. Okay? So he's pretty specific, okay? You gotta take a tenth deal, however big that, big that was, of flour, and then you have to take a fourth part of a tin of oil, and then you make some cakes um, and offer that. Okay, and then it, it keeps going on. It talks about, you know, the, the drink offering uh, and how to do that. If we drop down to, let's see here. Okay, yeah, it explains about in verse 9 about the bullock, and then you also mix that with flour. But if we drop all the way down to verse 15, it says, one ordinance shall be both for you, the congregation, and also for the stranger that sojourneth with you. An ordinance forever in your generations, as ye are, so shall the stranger be before the Lord. So it also calls the sacrifices also an ordinance. So that's gone. We don't have to do the sacrifices anymore. Doesn't mean we can't have a barbecue, but we, did, we don't do, do it the way they did in the Old Testament as a sacrifice for the Lord. Um, if you would turn to Leviticus 22, where there's another example of an ordinance. While you're going there, I'll just read for you a couple more verse, verses about um, the sacrifices. Numbers 18, 8 says, And the Lord spake unto Aaron, Behold, I also have given thee the charge of my heave offerings, of all the hallowed things of the children of Israel. Unto thee have I given them by reason of the anointing, and to thy sons by an ordinance forever. Another sacrifice that was an ordinance. So they give an offering, you know, where they would, you know, kind of lift it up. Um, Second Chronicles 2, 4. Behold, I build a house for the name of the Lord my God, to dedicate it to him, to burn before him sweet incense, and for the continual shoe bread, and for the burnt offerings, morning and evening, on the Sabbaths, and on the new moons, and on the solemn feast of the Lord of God. This is an ordinance forever to Israel. Okay, so there's a few things here in this verse. Okay, they don't have to burn sweet incense. They don't have to do the showbread. And um, they didn't, sorry, at this time they did, okay? But now we don't. And the new moons and solemn feasts, okay? So we don't have to have, every time a new moon starts, we don't have to have a, a feast or, or to, to even notice that anymore. Because that was an ordinance. You're there in Leviticus 22. It says in verse 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and to his sons, that they separate themselves from the holy things of the children of Israel, and they, that they profane not my holy name in those things which they hallow unto me. I am the Lord. So, when you read through the book of Leviticus, you see how Aaron was the high priest, and then his sons were after him. And it, and it, it explains to them how they had to prepare, what they had to put on, you know, how the breastplate was, and all these different things, how God told them how to make them. And then also, he says here that we just read, um, that they separate themselves, okay? Um, let's see here, let's go down. Well, let's just keep reading. Verse 3, it says, Say unto them, whosoever, whosoever he be of all your seed among your generations, that goeth unto the holy things, which the children of Israel hallow unto the Lord, having his uncleanness upon him, that soul shall be cut off from my presence, I am the Lord. Whatsoever, what man soever the seed of Aaron is a leper or hath a running issue, he shall need not eat of the holy things until he be clean. And whoso toucheth anything that is unclean by the dead, or a man whose seed goeth from him, 
or whosoever toucheth any creeping thing whereby he may be made unclean, or a man of whom he may take uncleanness, whatsoever uncleanness he hath, the soul which hath touched any such shall be unclean until even, and shall not eat of the holy things unless he wash his flesh with water. And when the sun is down, he shall be clean, and shall afterward eat of the holy thing, because it is his food. That which dieth of itself, or is torn with beasts, he shall not eat to defile himself therewith. I am the Lord. They shall therefore keep mine ordinance, lest they bear sin for it, and die therefore, if they profane it, I the Lord do sanctify them. Okay? So they have to do certain washings. Um, and, and, and a different part in the Old Testament also talks about they would take this heifer and they would burn it and they would heap the ashes and use that and mix it with water for, for, uh, for cleansing, for, for washing. Okay? And the New Testament actually references that with the, the ashes of a heifer. So these are ordinances. These are just three examples. There's more. Okay, so we got the feasts, we got we got the sacrifices, and then we got washings. Okay, and there where we were in Galatians five, or sorry, not Galatians five. It was uh, back in my notes. In Hebrews nine, where it said, "We stood only in meats and drinks, diverse washings and carnal ordinances." Okay. So the diverse washing, it also calls it a carnal ordinance. And the meats and drinks, I didn't read for you about that, but they weren't allowed to eat pork, they weren't allowed, because they were supposed to eat animals that chewed the cud and they have, had a cloven foot, okay? So the pigs didn't have both. Okay, they, they had the cloven foot, but they didn't chew the cud. So they weren't allowed to eat it. And then same thing with things in the water, they had to have scales and fins, okay? So they weren't allowed to eat shrimp because that doesn't have either. I don't know, maybe it has fins, but it doesn't have a scale, so I don't know how to look at that one. I just don't taste it. So, so the, there's, is there anything like intrinsically wrong with eating pork? They weren't supposed to do it. The reason it was wrong is because God told them not to do it. And that's the only reason it was wrong, okay? And, there is, and obviously there was a reason. He wanted them to be a separate people. He wanted them to be different than the world. Okay, just like today, we shouldn't just go along with every you know trend that the world has. We should be different. But but that didn't make it wrong unless God said so. Because um, before God told Moses that they couldn't do these things, they could actually do some of these things. Okay, so they could eat pork. Really, they could they could eat pork because in Genesis nine verse three it says. And then this is talking um, to, to Moses, or sorry, not Moses, Noah. It says, every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Even as a green herb have I given you all things. He says, every living thing that moveth, okay? So that didn't just limit it to, to cattle and to goats and to sheep. I mean, anything that moves. If you, you want to eat a worm, go ahead. You know, if, if that suits your fancy, you put some ketchup on it, it may not be too, too bad. But... The thing is, it moved. You could you could kill it. You could eat it. You could barbecue it, and, and or or cook it in soup. Whatever you wanted to do. Okay, so they couldn't eat pork because anything that moved, they could eat. Um, turn to Hebrews chapter eight. So in Exodus thirty-one, I'll just give you another example of something that they could do um, before. That, that once the law was given, they, they had to keep, okay? In Exodus 31, and you're going to Hebrews chapter 8, Exodus 31 verse 12 says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths you shall keep. And why? It says here, For it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. You shall keep the Sabbath therefore, for it is holy unto you, Everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death, for whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the seventh is the Sabbath of rest. Holy to the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall be surely put to death. So this is another law that God brought in with Moses. Obviously, when God created the world, he worked six days and he rested the seventh. But you don't find anywhere until you get to Moses 
the story of Moses, that they had to keep that Sabbath. And the reason he brought it in here, it says, it, it shall be a sign to you, okay? It says, uh, for it is a sign between me and you throughout the generations, that you may know that I am the Lord that doth, doth sanctify you, okay? So it is, it is a picture or a symbol that God sanctifies us, okay? It was a picture of Jesus Christ, the salvation we have through Jesus Christ, because in Jesus Christ, we don't have to do any part of the work. We believe on him, and that's all we have to do, okay? The Sabbath day, you weren't supposed to do any work. In fact, if you did work, they would kill you, okay? There, there's, a, there's a story in here of, of a man that actually did go out and, and do work, and they, they they, they held him until God would give him an answer and they were supposed to kill him. And you think, well, that sounds pretty harsh. Well, what about now? If, if you believe that you've got to do part of the work of salvation, if you believe you have to repent of your sins, or if you believe you have to do good works after you believe on Jesus to get you to heaven, you're going to die. You're going to die physically, and as soon as you die physically, you start dying spiritually in hell. Okay? And that is even more harsh than dying physically. Okay? That was a picture of salvation. But... Re Actual salvation is even more strict than that. You believe 99% on Jesus, but you got 1% on the work that you want to do, that you think you have to do, well, you're not going to make it to heaven. You've got to put 100% of your trust in Jesus Christ. Um, so, did I get you to turn to Hebrews 8? Okay, if you're there in Hebrews 8, uh, let's start there in verse 1. Now, the things which we have spoken, this is a sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Okay, this is talking about Jesus. He's our new high priest in the New Testament. A minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore it is of necessity that this man have someone also to offer. Okay, so this is talking about Jesus. He also had something to offer. He was a high priest. For if you were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law. Who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. There we see it again. The, the, the priests in the Old Testament were an example. They were a shadow of, of, of heavenly things. Okay? Um, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. So he showed Moses how different things in heaven are, how the temple in heaven is, he said, make it like this. This is how you should make it. And I mean, you know, I read the Bible through a couple times before I was saved, and when you get to some of those descriptions, it's some pretty dry reading if you're not really interested in it. And, you know, it tells you so and so many cubits for this, and, you know, you've got to make a skin of badger skin, and, you know, dye it this color, and, and you know, this many coals and staves, and they have the sockets like this, and, it, you know, it takes a little bit to get through it if you're, if you're not interested in it. And we should be interested in it. But I mean, it's still difficult as a saved person. We're not just going to, you know, eat it up. You have to, you know, get, really get, get into the Word of God and love the Word of God. And even if you don't feel like reading it, just push your way through it and get, get to the stories again. Like, obviously, the stories might be more interesting to us. But the more times we read through the Bible, the more interesting that even those parts get to us. So, the... All those things were a shadow of, of heavenly things. Verse 6. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is a mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. Okay? So he's saying, he, uh, in the letter to the Hebrews here, he's saying that Jesus had a more excellent ministry than the, than the high priest in the Old Testament. And because he's the mediator of a better covenant, okay? You, you talk to some Jews at soul wedding, and they say, well, you know, you call, you know, the Bible, the New Testament, the Old Testament, you know, you call it the Old Testament, we call it the Only Testament. Well, the New Testament is a better testament. It's a better covenant, the Bible says, because it, it reveals things that were still hidden in the Old Testament. Verse 7, for if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. Okay, so if, if that first one, there was no problem with it. Obviously, God's law didn't have a problem. The problem was with the people that didn't keep it. Then we wouldn't need the second or the, the new covenant. 
Verse 8, for finding fault with them, them we see it, so he's saying the fault is with them, not with the, with the covenant. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the day is come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So that, he's, he's uh, quoting the Old Testament there. He's talking about but God saying that he will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. Um, let's drop down to verse number 13. Now he saith, a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayed and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Okay, so he has a new covenant, so he's got the New Testament. So the, he made the first one old. Okay, and that's why we call it the Old Testament. And so we see with the new covenant that, that things have changed. Okay, it's not, not just keep going as you were. Things drastically changed when Jesus died because he fulfilled the Passover. He was the Passover lamb, so we no, no longer have to keep the, the Passover. He was the Sabbath, okay? He is our Sabbath. He, he is our rest. Um, and so we, because of the time of Reformation, we no longer have to worry about meats and drinks and diverse washings and corona ordinances. Um, let's turn to Romans 14. So we can eat uh, pork and shrimp, and we don't have to keep the Passover. We don't need to wash with the ashes of a heifer anymore. Uh, we don't even have to keep the Sabbath, but some people might say, well, some of those things don't really fall into carnal ordinances. We should still keep, we should still keep those laws. Okay, and there are people that say, well, even today, like that claim the name of Jesus, that you shouldn't eat pork, okay? And some of it is just ignorance. People haven't read the Bible. Most of it, I mean, obviously, a lot of them aren't saved. I mean, but even saved people can fall into weird doctrines. Not, it, it's just some weird things because there, there's saved people that are vegetarians, okay, that, that might think it's wrong to hurt animals or that they're they're babies. But what does it say in Romans 14, 1 about these people? Okay, it says, "Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may may eat all things; another who is weak." It first, okay. So we're still supposed to receive those bread, brethren if they're if they're saved, okay. But it's calling them weak, and the thing is, they are weak. They're weak in doctrine. Uh, they're weak in their mind. So, but this is how we're supposed to deal with them. Verse three: Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. Let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Okay. So we we'll, we'll still allow them into our fellowship, but. They shouldn't judge us because we eat, eat meat. And, and we'll we'll just allow them. As long as they're not trying to preach it to us as a false doctrine, we'll, we'll, we'll still put up with it. Verse 4. Who art thou that judges another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yet he shall be old enough, for God is able to make him stand. Now we switch into a different topic. Verse 5. One man esteemeth one day above another, Another esteemeth every day alike, but every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. So he's saying, some people will be, you know, Saturday is a Sabbath, and you're saying you shouldn't work. I mean, some people think Sunday, you shouldn't work. That's the way I was taught growing up, and it never really made sense to me because Sunday was the first day of the week, I thought. Although some calendars do make it the seventh day of the week. But, it, so... One people, some people esteem one day above another. So let's talk about Sabbaths. Let's talk about holidays. Okay. Some people think you, you can't work on Easter. You can't work on Christmas. Okay. But in verse six it says, "He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord. And he regard that regardeth not the day to the day to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth eateth to the Lord for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord he eateth not to give thanks." Okay, so you're saying, so the people that keep the Sabbath, if they're actually doing it right, they're regarding it to the Lord. I mean, they shouldn't be keeping the Sabbath, because Jesus was, was our, is our Sabbath. But if they do it, they're supposedly doing it to, to the Lord, okay? And so if they're taking Easter off, they're doing it to, to praise the Lord. Or some might be just taking it for another day off from work, right, and then go, go shopping. Um, and that's how it often was, you know, 
people in the religion I was growing up. And the Mennonites, you know, they'd be take off, they would take three days off for, let's say, Easter. So they'd have Easter, and they'd have Easter Monday and Easter Tuesday. Well, a lot of the Mennonites would take off those days from work, but then they would go to Winnipeg and go shopping. So were they really keeping that holiday? They weren't regarding it to the Lord. But in the first place, they didn't have to esteem that day above another. That just doesn't make sense. And, and once you read your Bible and you see, well, that's not, in the New Testament, it isn't like that. It, it just, I mean, everything in the New Testament just gives you more freedom. It just, it just, in your mind, it just opens everything up and explains it. Um, so keep going, verse 7 says, For none must live with himself, no man dieth himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and living. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge us rather than no man but a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Okay, so if, if there's somebody that thinks they've got to keep the Sabbath, we shouldn't put a stumbling block in, in their way and say, hey, you want to go shopping today? Because in their mind, that's wrong. Okay, so we shouldn't try to entice them to sin because, um, yeah, and I'll, actually it explains it more further down here in, in the passage, um, because we don't want them to fall. It says in verse 15, Sorry, verse 14. I know and am persuaded by the Lord G Jesus that there is nothing unclean of himself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Okay, so when you're eating, you're eating pork or, or something else in the Old Testament, Moses of the law told you not to do. It says, Paul is saying here in Romans that there's nothing unclean of itself. But he says, if somebody thinks it's unclean, to him it is unclean, because that's what he thinks. Verse 15, But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably, destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. So if he thinks pork is wrong, don't invite him over for a pork barbecue. Okay? Have beef instead. And, and I don't know how many people that are actually saved would actually fall into this of idea of not thinking. Obviously it would be people that didn't read their Bible or had really been brainwashed. Because I think people that are saved, they, they, they hear the voice of the shepherd, and if they actually read, they'll, they'll go through it and understand. But that doesn't mean that saved people can't fall off into weird weird ideas. Verse 15, But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably, destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. So it says you're destroying not with thy meat. So how are you destroying him if it really isn't sin? But um, if you drop down... To verse 20, it says, For meat destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he allowed. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So right there we see that if, if he's eating and, it's, and he's not having faith that it's okay, he's actually sinning. Okay? But verse 22 it says, Happy is he that condemneth not himself in the thing which he loved. So if you, you know that it's not sin to work on, on Sunday or on Saturday, you go do it and, and, and do some work or go shopping, happy are you because you allow it. You know it's, it's right, okay? But our brothers that don't know it's right, or, or have some mixed up ideas, okay, we, we don't want to put a stumbling block in front of them. And we don't want them to, to oh, that smells really good because you invited them to some bacon cheeseburgers and they, you know, they're, they want to taste that bacon, and, but yet they think it's, maybe think it's sin or they are more uh, adamant that it's sin. And, then, and so they are sinning, even though it wouldn't have been sin if they knew it was okay, but because they think it isn't, they're sinning. 
So we can see that the kingdom of God is not mean drink, okay? And, and that if you don't esteem one day above another, it's okay, okay? Because that, all those holidays, keeping, if you worked on those holidays, that wasn't wrong, except God told them not to. That was why it was wrong. They weren't intrinsically wrong to work on those days. But we shouldn't put stumbling blocks in front of other people that think differently about that. Um, because if they do it anyway, they, they are sinning because they are doubting. Let's turn to Colossians 2. Okay, so this makes it pretty clear, but there, there's another place here. Well, I have Colossians 2. I'll read for you Galatians 4, verse 9, where it makes it even clearer about, about the days. Galatians 4, verse 9 says, But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements where to, to ye desire again to be bondage? Okay, he's saying, why, now that you know God, or rather that God knows you, okay, that you're saved, why do you want to be in the bondage of the law of Moses again? It says in verse 10, you observe days and months and times and years. I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. So he's worried that these people, are they actually not saved after all? Like they're thinking that they got to keep all these days, they got to keep the Sabbath and, and, and the new moon and, and all these different things. Did he even really get salvation? He's afraid of them, lest they have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Obviously, if they believe they were for sure saved, but he's, he's starting to have doubts about them because of their observing days and months and times and years. So there we can see that for sure we don't have to keep the Sabbath anymore, okay? It's, he's afraid of them because of that. So if you're there in Colossians chapter 2, and this is Paul's letter to the Colossians. Um, yeah, just some nuggets hit throughout this chapter, so it's, it's a short chapter, so I'll kind of skip around in it. So, Verse 4, Colossians 2, verse 4 says, And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. Okay, so he's worried. In verse 5, it says here, For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joy, and beholding your order, and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus to the Lord, so walk ye in him, Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, faith as he had been taught, bonding therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. So he's worried. He's not with them physically, okay? He's with them in the spirit, okay? He's, he's hearing about what they're doing. He's beholding uh, their order and the steadfastness of their faith. But he, he's worried or he doesn't want, he's warning them that they shouldn't let any man spoil them through philosophy and vain deceit, okay? He shouldn't, like, after the tradition of men. You know, he doesn't want somebody coming up to him, hey, this is how we always have done it. That, that's the way it makes sense. You should do it. Or this makes logical sense. Do it this way. He doesn't want them to, to have somebody use philosophy to explain things differently than what he had explained it to them. Um, let's keep going here. Verse 9, for in him dwell all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made it without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who has raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, have been quickened together with him, having forgiven all trespasses. So this is another ordinance. The ordinance of circumcision. Okay? But it says here that we are circumcised um, by the circumcision of Christ. Okay? So we have a circumcision made without hands. It's not a physical circumcision. So that's another ordinance that was blotted out. In verse 14 he says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. I mean, circumcision wasn't a natural thing, okay? It was kind of contrary. I mean, they had to stop moving their camp for a few days till everybody healed up. So, it wasn't that being uncircumcised was a sin, except that God told them to do it. Because, I mean, obviously God made the males like that. 
But then to be separate, he, he told him to do it this way at, at the time of Moses and then until the New Testament. Verse 15, And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Okay, now this is where we get into what I really want to talk about. Verse 16, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink, or in respect of an holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days. So don't let anybody try to convince you that you're sinning if you're eating pork, you know, or, or if you're drinking something that in the Old Testament you weren't supposed to drink, or in respect of an holy day, okay, a new moon, or the Sabbath days. So don't, you know, don't let it bother you if people are going to judge you. Like, don't let them judge you. Like, just whatever. Like, I know better than that. Like, the Bible tells us in a few different places now. We read about carnal ordinances. Here we read about, again about meat and drink. And, the, and then the, and the holidays. Verse 17 says, Which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Let no man beguile you. So here's another warning. Of your reward and a voluntary humility, worshipping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his flesh and mind. Okay, so he's saying, Don't let anybody trick you. Don't let anybody entice you to a different. Um, um, different doctrine. Verse 19, not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands, having nourishment ministered, knit together, increaseth with the increase of God. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why is the whole living in the world are you subject to ordinances? So you say, why, if you're dead with Christ, why are you going to go and be subject to the ordinances? Why are you going to go, you know, get your children circumcised? Or why are you going to go and keep these feasts when you're dead with Christ? Okay? You don't have to do it. Verse 21, touch not, taste not, handle not. See, that's what these people are telling them. You know, don't touch that carcass, you know, because then you're unclean until evening and then you got to wash with whatever you got to wash with. Okay? Like, like, don't eat that. Don't, don't work on that faith. It says here, verse 22, which all are to perish with using after the commandments and doctrines of men. So these are now commandments and doctrines of men because in the Old Testament there were commandments of God, and now God's says you don't have to do it anymore. So if you're doing this, you're following the commandment of man. You're not following the commandment of God anymore. Okay? And verse 23, it says, which things indeed have a, sh indeed a show of wisdom and will worship, and humility and neglecting of the body, not needing honor to satisfying the flesh. Okay? So these things, they have a show of, of wisdom. Okay? So some of these things, it's not sin to do just because we're not required not to do it anymore. Okay? If you want to eat, not eat pork because think it's healthy or not to, as long as you know it's not sin, you're not sinning, okay? In fact, in the Bible, it often talks about washing, you know, like, if you did this, you touch a dead body, you should wash, and be clean until evening, in other words, don't, you know, go touch somebody else and make them germ. And we, we know now today with today's science, you know, it's important to wash, it's important to keep clean, so you're not sinning if, you, if you're washing, but why would you go exactly according to the way they, they did it here, right? Like, why would you go and get, you know, get a heifer and, and you know, burn it and then use that ashes to, to wash yourself? You have soap nowadays. Why would you go take a perfectly good heifer that if you could get bread in the bowl, you can get a calf next year. Why would you go take that thing and burn it just to make soap? We have other soap today. So, um, and that, you don't have to turn there, but Galatians 2 verse 11, here, here's an example of the disciples and apostles in the New Testament where there was, this was, there was a little bit of an issue here. Okay, this is the story of uh, when Peter and James and Paul, um, they, they met together, okay? It says here in Galatians 2 verse 11, it says, But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. Okay, so Peter was a very important apostle, who was a good apostle, he, he had some he, good doctrine, but that doesn't mean he never made any mistakes, okay? Paul says he was to be blamed, so he was at fault. He did something wrong. Verse 12, for before that certain came from James, he didn't eat with the Gentiles, okay? So he was eating with the Gentiles. He was sitting down with them, having fellowship with them. Who knows, he might have had, you know, some, some bacon, he might have had some pork. But, what happened? But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were the circumcision. Okay? So he's, he's worried about what other people were going to think. He was eating with these uncircumcised Gentiles. Who knows, he might have even been eating food that told him not to eat in, in, 
the Old Testament, even though God gave him a vision of this, of this big sheep nick at the four corners filled with all kinds of animals, and God said, don't call, what God hath cleansed, call not thou common. Okay? So God told him it was okay to eat that. And some people say, well, that was just you know a metaphor or that was just a, a symbol. But you think God would tell him to commit a sin just to prove a point? That doesn't make any sense, right? Because if God says, don't call that unclean or don't call that common, he's saying that's okay to eat because God has cleansed that. But anyways, he, he was scared of the people of the circumcision, what they would think. Uh, you know, I mean, these were maybe his friends or colleagues. And he was worried what, what they would think of him being with the, the, the Gentiles. And what happens, verse 13, And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. Okay, so not only does he get up and leave that table and goes to be with the circumcised people, all the other Jews go, go with him because, well, if Peter's doing it, well, then we better do it too. He's a Jewish friend of us to make fun of us or, or, or argue with us. You know, sometimes it's just easier to go along to get along instead of making a point and swimming upstream. So verse 14, it says, But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Okay, so he's saying, you're already living like a Gentile. You're not living according to the customs uh, of the law of Moses anymore. You know that, that you don't have to do it. Why are you going to tell the Gentiles they've got to live like the Jews? Okay, so we see here that Peter and Paul knew that the law had changed. Okay, so it's so we don't want to throw out the whole law, okay? But on the other hand, we don't want to go to the other side of the spectrum and be like these Judaizers or these Hebrew roots people and think that we still got to keep the feast, you know, of unleavened bread and the feast of tabernacles. Like I heard with some distant relative that I heard that, that he was going somewhere and holding this feast of tabernacles. I'm going to probably, and I, I believe that in the, in the New Testament, that in the future we'll probably have the Feast of Tabernacles with God in heaven after the rapture, okay? You know, that's prophecy that's not 100% clear, but I think the Bible teaches that. But that doesn't mean we keep the, the Feast of Tabernacles, no. It's just these Judaizers want to bring us back into bondage. And that's what Paul was warning the Galatians about, okay? That, that he was worried about them, that, that they had gotten free. Why did they want the desire to be back in bondage? So, and, and these Judaizers and Hebrew roots, they, you know, teach people that, that, that they shouldn't eat pork. And, and I think they even teach people they should keep Saturday and not work. I think that's what they do. And uh, so we know that the, keeping the law doesn't save us, okay? But we also know that breaking the law won't send us to hell if we're believers and we, we receive that eternal life. But the thing is, we don't want to be chastised for, for not keeping the things that are still valid. Okay? And that's why we need to see that yes, though the carnal ordinances are gone away, and, and the diverse washings and the meats and drinks are done away, that doesn't mean that we can go out and steal. Okay? That doesn't mean that we can go and lust after somebody. There's, there's, there's still things that, that we, we have to do and not just love everybody. And the thing is, the guy was partially right. If you love your neighbor as yourself, that is the whole law. Because if you love them, you will do all the rest of these laws and these rules that God told, told you to do. If you love God and you love your neighbor, you're going to do all these laws. But their idea of love isn't keeping all these laws. It's just, you know, just being nice and maybe smiling to them and, you know, wishing them having a good day. And, and not having anything to do with them after that. So we don't want God to chastise us for, for doing things wrong. Because in Hebrews 12, 6 it says, For for the Lord, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, scourges every son, son whom he receiveth. So if you're saved, God's going to chastise you if you messed up, okay? Because he wants to correct you and, and, and he wants to bless you, okay? And he loves us and wants us to keep his commandments so he can bless us more. We should love him by keeping his commandments. Jesus says in John 14, verse 15, he says, If you love me, keep my commandments. So if we love him, we will want to keep his commandments. The commandments don't get us saved, but we should still keep his commandments because we love him. Okay, let's, let's follow in a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord.